So who do we have up next? Well, we've got Ed Tucker up next. Oh, that's exciting. And I reckon that we probably don't have to do any prompting with Ed because we know him quite well. And he's kind of like got a lot to say. Very, very rare I've got anything to say. Yeah, <laughs> absolute <laughs> cobblers, mate. <laughs> so do you want to turn your mic up a little bit, Ed? Yeah, no problem at all. No problem oh, at all. Is that a bit better? That's absolutely perfect. Yep. It's awesome, good. mate. Awesome, mate. How, how good was that from Dan? Oh, oh yeah. that's a crazy. Wow. Yeah. That, that, I that's just amazing. sat on mute. That's just absolutely awesome. Absolutely awesome. Legend. Legend. He's, uh, yeah, the guy's a star. And, uh, and to be fair to Dan, he's been part and parcel of what the beer farmers have been doing all year long. You know, we did a, we did a CTF thing for B-Size London and, and Dan did that for us. And, you know, it was a triviality in many ways because we gave away a hoodie at the end of it. But Dan went away behind the scenes, built the CTF. We ran the CTF. Somebody won a hoodie, um, and that person that won the hoodie was absolutely smitten that they'd won a hoodie, and it was thanks to Dan getting involved in that. And awesome. I think he's one of the most busy people I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. constantly on the go, constantly doing, on the go. Yeah, doing he, his thing. Just, yeah, just right. remember, he's uh, he's up in I think an hour or so. So yeah, yeah. we'll get to chat to him then. He did yeah, an awesome. Uh, just a big shout out to Dan as well. He did an awesome CTF at Kentucky Castle. Apparently, it's Gold Gold Knight themed. Apparently, it was went down incredibly well there as well. He loves his James Bond. He loves his James Bond. Yeah, his and the, Aston Martin. Huh? He loves his Aston. He loves yeah. his Aston. And there is a rumor he might he might be in his Aston when he does his talk later. So yeah. you, you mean his Ford? You... Oh, don't don't say that, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> don't be saying that. All right, let's crack on with Ed. Ed. How do? Good evening, mate. You okay? I'm good, mate. I'm good. I'm Thank good. How, how's, how's it all your end? Uh, going all right. A couple of technical issues, but yeah, yeah. But the people that you can't see have managed to make it pretty smooth. Yeah, yeah. You, you wouldn't notice. You wouldn't notice. No, you wouldn't notice. So we've got people, we've got a place for people to speak, and we've got a, p- a place for people to listen, and that's exactly what we needed. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, yeah. that's that's all you need. The last thing you need is hiccups, kind of going through. But you've 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 ridden it well so far. So you know, welcome to the welcome to the world of live services. Well, exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> right, mate. So you know the script in that there isn't a script. Awesome. Um, so what do you want to talk about? Uh, I, I suppose I, I was mulling this over earlier as to kind of what what's been floating my boat recently. Probably the one thing that I'd call out. Uh, and I, I kind of touched on it when we were up in Ignite, although after a few beers, it didn't really go as well as I wanted. Um, uh, essentially around dislocation. Uh, and when I say dislocation is, is the, the fact that in so many aspects of security, um, there is a clear disjoint between what we need to achieve and what we're actually doing on a daily basis. Um, Agreed. Uh, and and you'd say that from the, you know there's a complete disjoin between the vendor community and and I'd put the analyst community because they're more vendor swayed and the actual defender community. Um, there's huge dislocation in the defender community between what different teams do, um, the dependence they they have within other teams, whether it's in IT, whether it's in wider business, uh, covered by process and people failures. Um, and there's a clear dislocation even in security itself. I mean, how many times do you see an education and awareness team that doesn't actually, is in no way aware of working with their operations team when it comes to actually educating the workforce? Um, and it's something that I think when, until we start to relocate these things or actually understand our dependencies and join things back together, join the dots back together and start working collaboratively, um, that essentially we're just going to go out there doing the same thing we've done for God knows how many years now and perpetually fail. Good point. So in the in, in a business, and I work in a business, I guess the example I've seen is where you've got the systems development team, so guys that write software for a living. Uh, you've got infrastructure people, so they're building servers and other stuff, whether it be on-prem or SaaS or whatever. Um, you've got the networking people. And then out here in a little on a little island, you've got the security team. And I guess the challenge we have is becoming integrated with all of those disciplines and getting our views and our consultancy and advice and all that kind of stuff pushed as far left as possible. And I think for me, as a, a guy that kind of leads a team trying to do that, that's our biggest challenge. 
Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And, and I'd say it's not an isolated challenge that's, that's by any means just security as well. Um, certainly where, I, you know, where I've worked previously, there's been a disjoint between, say, digital teams in that more software delivery side of things, that iterative side, that development side, um, and the incumbent kind of IT facets that they have to work with, like networks and, um, and for example, kind of cloud or infrastructure teams or whoever it happens to be, and live services, the people who then have to run it and make it happen and make change management happen. Um, and just disjoint between all of these teams that when it works badly, you just end up with a whole bunch of people just butting heads against each other. Yeah. That really hampers the ability to deliver what really matters, which is actually let's have systems, services, technology that our customers, which will be the customers within the business and the customers outside of the business, um, can actually use our simple, effective and available. And from yeah. a security angle are ideally as least risky as possible or at least within a comfort zone of risk. So uh, can I can I go back to that point because I think you you're you're breaking into an area that that I think we do have a problem and when you talk about these groups not being able to come together in the interests of the business do you feel it's because we're we're maybe promoting the wrong people we take very strong technical people and then we say, okay, poof, you're a manager. And then we don't actually give them any training as managers. And now they're expected to both manage a team, communicate to external teams and still be the technical resource. Are, are we, the TLDR of my question is, are we setting ourselves up for failure because of our hiring and, and promoting practices? Um, I, I would say that's a part of it, although it's 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 not a one size fits all, and this is just from personal experience. Um, I think we don't focus enough on soft skills. Uh, when I say soft skills, a large part of that is kind of relationship building, fostering relationships, being able to communicate, being able to think outside kind of what our immediate sphere of influence is and what our immediate drivers are. I also think that we're a little bit and, and whether it's a leadership thing or whatever it happens to be that we're a bit myopic in how we treat teams so we'll we'll look at the networks team and say that's your absolute focus that's your absolute focus your focus is keep everything up and running keep the lights on and manage change um, we'll look at the infrastructure guys and kind of say exactly the same and build things in time for, for projects that need to Dev team, you need to constantly develop the next things and you make sure um, it's built with the, that absolute user focus and get the latest versions out, get everything up and running. And we don't really look at how all of these things are actually dependent upon each other. Um, and if we don't recognize the dependencies, we're kind of setting our teams up to fail, regardless of who we put in charge of them. Um, uh, and, and how I've seen it kind of actually bridge that gap at times is where individuals have taken it upon themselves to say, do you know what? I'm fed up of just butting heads with other teams. It's not serving us any good. It's detracting me from my day job. It's detracting them from their day job and it's hampering us all from delivering. So let's go and bridge that gap individually as personal people, as human beings and start to then bridge it as teams and start to understand kind of, well, what are your drivers? You, you development team, networks team, security team, whichever team, I don't really care. What are your drivers? What are you trying to achieve? What are you, what's your pipeline look like? What's your day-to-day -day life look like? How can I make your life easier? Because if I can make your life easier, there's a chance that you might make my life easier and understand what my drivers are. And together we can start to build something a bit more collaborative that allows us both to achieve our goals without us just banging our heads against each other. Um, and, and ended up just, just spending our days at work really, really frustrated, really pissed off, and then going home and feeling the same. Um, and a large part of that's requiring you to put your ego to one side and even working with people that you vehemently dislike and just going, do you know what? I don't care about the individual. I care about the outcome. So you, you, you kind of touch on what I was going to ask. Um, sh should this not come from management as well to, to some aspects? So the one thing I see teams clashing heads and to me, it, it's kind of crazy to think you work for the same company. You should be helping each other because at the end of the day, you're trying to achieve the same goal, be it provide a service, um, generate revenue, generate profit, whatever. So uh, is it perhaps management needs to get involved um, and try and force better engagement between teams rather than an individual level? Um, 
I think I think you can recognise it. Certainly, you can recognise it from a management point of view. Um, I think if you're developing a culture, which is in, in essence what this is, is it's a culture of collaboration. Whether you call it DevOps, whether you call it DevSecOps, whether you call it actually just teams working together in the right way so that they each get mutual benefit. Um, culture for me is always a groundswell. Um, it works best when it's people who are actually facing off to each other. I think from a management point of view, we should encourage and facilitate, provide the mechanisms to do that, provide people with the headspace to go and understand the teams they're butting heads with, or even just getting the most demand from. Even if that demand is, you know, it, it's a very mutual demand, it's a very um, happy demand, you work really well with each other, there's just too much of it, um, to actually just encourage them and give them that headspace to work it through. Um, for me, it's always worked best, work best when the people doing have worked directly with each other and start to build relationships. And we as managers and leaders can help facilitate, really put it in their hands to actually work together properly. I don't want to push down a culture, I want to build a culture upwards. So, so Ed, let me ask you a question here. Um, a bit like the question I asked Jess earlier. How are you finding it when you, you know, for those who don't know, you, you run a business and, and part of your business is increasing awareness. That's what you, mm -hmm. you, you try yep, to yep. do, develop collaboration and all that kind of thing, which is what we're all about. Yep. But when you go out and do your job, are you finding it easy? Are you finding uh, a lot of resistance? How are you finding culture? I, I guess it possibly differs depending on the, the industry vertical it, that you look it, at. It, 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 it does depend a little bit, um, uh, generally, dog rough. Right. Dog rough. And, and this comes back to the dislocation. Even simple things, like I said before, that your operations team and your awareness team don't work together. Yes. Yeah. Like, well, if they don't work together, how are you making people aware of the threats they're facing on a daily basis? This is really simple. These are two teams that work within the same area that should just talk to each other. Uh, yeah. And I've seen this in organisations where the CISO has been there six months and the CISO has been there, you know, the best part of 10 years and, 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 and just seeing this dislocation that actually hampers things mm -hmm. or understanding that kind of um, your operations team, your security operations team has clear dependencies on things like your exchange team, your network team, your infrastructure team, your desktop team, your AV team, and they don't work with them. They've all got manual processes in place. They don't have the mechanisms in place to work together, which is a cultural thing. It's not a technological thing. It's a process and people thing, which is a, it, essentially down to a cultural thing. And that can span across um, not only geographies, it can span across organizations into suppliers as well. Yeah. And, and it's a personal thing that, again, it's very similar to kind of that, you know, whether it's DevOps or whatever you want to call it, even working with suppliers as well is, is giving people the ability to bridge these gaps. Uh, and understanding and, and part of this, and this is where as a leadership side, we need to change our focus and we need to move away from what the industry tells us, which is predominantly we need that we need to look at things in a vertical manner. Mm. So we need to look at things like education and awareness as a thing in its own right. And we've got a Gartner right quadrant and we've got a forest of wave and we've got a whatever it happens to be. Education and awareness is a thing in its own right. Yeah, and you just go, no, no, it isn't. It isn't at all. Education and awareness leads to something else. Education and awareness, having an aware workforce is not an outcome. It's not an outcome in any way, shape or form. If your workforce is aware, now what? It bleeds into something else. Maybe they'll spot things. Maybe they'll report things. Oh, so you start to bleed into operations because now you've got to have teams that need to look at stuff. And it becomes behavior, it, right? It, it's behavioral, it's cultural, it's process, it's people and it's technology all conjoined. You know, when we say PPT, they're not three individual items. They're three items that are absolutely conjoined with each other at the hip. But we rarely think of them in that way. And our industry is actually teaches us not to think that way. Our industry tells us you need insider threat programs, you need awareness programs. Our compliance regimes do the same thing. They tell us we need PCI DSS, you need an education awareness program that runs at least once a year. And, and, and they break them down into silos. Yet all the problems we have run horizontal. Yet our industry teaches us to look at them vertically. And then we wonder why we don't move forwards because we never understand the joins between them so we're almost taught to dislocate ourselves from the actual problem i couldn't agree more and i think operationally i see it a lot um you have technical security people and i consider myself to be one of those where our focus is on for example the 30 out of date debian machines that you've got over there 
Yeah. Yep. And you you risk assess them and go, well, actually, you know, they're public facing on the internet and therefore they are potentially risky. But you're not going to have that conversation in the boardroom, right? No. Nope. You're not going to wander into your, your CEO or whatever and go, look, <laughs> we've got 30 Debian machines over there because that is a language that is of no consequence whatsoever. Yep. For that level Absolutely. of the organization. And when you think, when you think about it differently, the conversation that you're then going to have with your board or your executive people or whatever is going to be more like, did you know that we have a risk of financial loss? And then the question then becomes, well, why? And then we start analysing the reasons for it, which may well be the 30 Debian machines that are well out of date. But actually, when you're managing risk at that high end of the organisation, it's talking about company closure. It's talking about job losses. It's talking about um, severe penalties from a regulator like the ICO and such and such, uh, reputational harm and all that kind of stuff, operational downtime. Those are the kind of conversations that you are going to have at the XCO level of the organization. You're never going to bring them an XSS risk. <laughs> right. nope. And that's, nope. that's the huge disconnect you've got between operational security on the ground within an org and how that might thread its way through to an actual material piece of harm that gets caused then to the organization. And I think that's the, the sort of transition or transcendence even that we need to make in the industry. Yeah, def definitely so. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's not the only one as well, but, but absolutely. And, and when you look at kind of those machines that, you know, that, that are there and, and are potentially um, essentially representing a, a potential risk and especially the closeness of the Internet and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of says, but there's a reason why they're in that state in the first place as well. Uh, which is generally a people and process side and a budget thing as to why those machines are in the state they're in. I mean, one of the good things is we're actually aware of them in the first place. When you think about people's awareness of asset management, it's pretty low, let alone the health of those assets. But hey-ho, at least we're aware of these assets. But what yeah. actually led them to be in the state they're in in the first place? Because we can look at these and we can kind of do the elastoplast thing, which is either we patch them, we bring them up to date, we take them off the network, we segregate them, we do whatever. But by no means are they going to be the only ones. No. By a long shot. And there's a reason why our machines are potentially in the state they're in. In fact, there's many reasons. And we need to start digging down these holes to then understand what's our overall picture when we want to have these discussions in a way that our board understands. Let's look at this you know, effectively systemic issue that we have across the entire organization, potentially, that leads us to present risks to the internet that might lead to financial loss, regulatory issues, compliance issues, whatever it happens to be, even reputational stuff, or, or actually maybe nothing, but just running the risk of something happening. Mm. That let's get into this to understand what the systemic risk drivers we have within the organization, because at some point it's going to bite us, most likely an availability issue. Most yeah. likely we're going to run old antiquated kit, we're going to have a hodgepodge network that just connects all sorts of shite together. Uh, with all sorts of ports and protocols running way beyond the optimal, only necessary stuff only from the you know day one that we started with once upon a time to thousands and thousands of rules, most of which are redundant, um, to actually kind of um, build into why are we in this state and how can we as a business move forward and what levers do we have like digital transformation to actually start to alleviate a lot of the issues that we have as an industry today because there are many things we can use to help us without having to go hook and by crook to try and try and find a way to get budget try and find a way to admit we don't really know what's going on and actually come back to that cultural piece that says if i work with these people who are driving the new future maybe i can drive my optimization and my improvements along the way and those 30 machines that present a risk, maybe I can put those on the pipeline to actually move forwards and build the processes that means they don't go back into that state again. Yeah. I was going to jump in with something that I find that the, that the word uh, digital transformation is being bandied about in organizations. And for the points that you just kind of outlined, Ed, I think you know, it is impossible for some organizations, like Becky pointed out with the legacy technical debt, to, to digitally transform. And a lot of the times, I think 
the strategy is lacking. Do you, do you find that the business is, well, maybe this is the true point, is that the business's trajectory and what they want to accomplish isn't properly articulated in technological terms that the tech teams can follow and that that, that disconnect is, is one of the core issues? Um, it, it, I, I think it, it leads to a core issue or certainly one that I've seen many times is that, um, you know, when you kind of say to the business, what is it you want to do? What is it you want to achieve? Um, it's actually a really hard question to answer. You know, you say, well, what do you want to do with this data? Oh, I, I, I want to understand it better. OK, yeah, but what do you want to do? What do you want to understand? How do you want to understand it? What do you want to understand about your customers? How do you want to delve down to lead to what? To, to to develop what, to, for what betterment of the organization. It's really hard to actually delve and do that requirement stuff properly, which I think we're generally quite rubbish at. Um, but it also leads to us not being able to explain that. And we can't expect the business to explain it in a technical way, but we should interpret it into a more technical standard, a business strategy into an IT, a digital strategy, whatever you want to call it. But I think with that disjoint there, we almost end up with a digital strategy that tells the business what it wants. Um, don't get me wrong, one of the big drivers there is that it's very much user-focused, user-driven, user-led, user interaction that security can learn a hell of a lot from because security is still too far divorced and dislocated from its end customers, from the customers of security, which leaves us with this massive gap of developing stuff for security rather than for our customers. Um, but it leaves us with this disjoint there that we're actually not doing a collaborative digital strategy um, you know, you've got security on the outside of it. You've got the business probably closer than you would expect. You've got different aspects of IT that aren't as close as they should be because they've got a day job of running the business, running the IT of the business. Uh, for a coherent one, it comes back to that behavior, that culture of an absolutely inclusive strategy that's driven by all of us. That said, this isn't utopia. So will it ever happen? No. But we can bridge the gaps to make it a little bit better than it is today. And that starts with a conversation that starts with leaving your ego at the door, not trying to prove how big your technical competence is, not trying to prove how much better than someone you are, not trying to prove how much sway you have in the organization. that You can block them and stop them achieving their goals and just going, do you know what? We need to bloody work together because if the business is to thrive, we need to collaborate. If we collaborate, all our lives get easier and we can actually achieve something really quite special. Amen to that, brother. All right, Ed, your time is up, mate. Thank you very much for having me. Well, thank and you and I've hardly time. sworn, so Preakal probably won't believe it's me. I was trying to it. count. I was trying to count the amount of times you sworn. I think it was like twice or something like that. I was taking a little tally. I can't, I'm, I can't I'm being believe. nice. You, you're doing it for charity, so I won't use the other C word. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Ed, thanks for your time. Really good. No, thank good, you. Sensible stuff there. Really good, good advice. Um, and catch you soon, mate. Cheers. Brilliant. Good luck with the rest of the evening, guys, and Thanks, tomorrow. Man. And uh, yeah, I'll get some sleep while you guys can stay up. Cheers, boys. Oh, Thanks, Ed. Oh, no worries, man. Cheers. You're such a you're such a good guy.